the slide that was, was it 52 or 53 Valentines? Did, did anybody see that? No, I mean, they said it was their 52nd or 53rd Valentine together. Did anybody, yeah. 52nd? It makes me feel young again. I think that's great. <laughs> what a remarkable thing to be able to say, uh, to spend uh, all those wonderful years together. Uh, this morning, we're continuing, actually completing our series on the prayer adventure, and I want to start in Daniel, uh, the ninth chapter, and this is what it says. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures according to the word of the Lord, given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. Going down to verse 17. Now our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servants for your sake, Lord, Look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, our God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make request of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. I, I think that is the foundation of all prayer. I really do. God does not answer our prayers because we are good. He answers our prayers because he is good. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act for your sake, my God. Do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. Uh, I honestly believe this. The outcome of any situation is different when you pray than it is if you don't pray. I'm not suggesting that we always get exactly what we want, when we want, the way we want, where we want, but I am convinced that once prayer has been inserted into a situation, the outcome is influenced by it. Uh, one of the Christmas presents that I got from my wife, Sue, this year was something that she requested. It's an herb garden, and it's a hydroponic herb garden, which means that it grows, the herbs grow in water. It's got an LED light contraption, and it's basically idiot-proof, which is just the right thing for me. And that is that it tells you when to add water, it tells you when to add nutrients, and it actually turns the lights on and off all by itself. And so you plug it in, you put the little seed pods in the tray, you add water, and then you wait. Yeah, because the only time you ever see a magic beanstalk that grows overnight is in fairy tales. You have to work. wait. What's true is that it still is about five times faster than planting these seeds in soil, but you still have to wait. Many of the things that we desire are seeds that we have planted, but they have to be planted in prayer, and we have to learn how to wait. And you don't just pray one time any more than you would water a plant, just one time. In fact, this may sound discouraging when I say it, but I hope it feels encouraging by the time we get to the end of our talk today. And that is some of your prayers may not be answered in your lifetime. That does not mean they will not be answered. The question is, would we be willing to pray for something that we would never actually get to see? Or for people that would benefit from something that we would never get to know? Daniel was that kind of person. He's one of the most impressive people in all of history. He was a prisoner of war that wound up becoming a prime minister of the very kingdom that had abducted him. He had been taken captive when he was an adolescent, and his meteoric rise is the stuff of legend. And while he was studying one day in scriptures, he came across a prophecy that was given by Jeremiah. And in it, he discovered information, and the information said that what they were going through right then this exile and separation from their homeland and their homeland being torn down and overrun, that that would last for 70 years. Daniel's not a young man when he reads this. And so that means he's never going to see Israel restored. And what's fascinating to me is at that moment, he decides to turn this into a prayer assignment. This is interesting to me for two reasons. One is, you could make the argument, well, it's a prophecy, and if God says it's going to happen, then it's going to happen, and I don't really need to pray. 
But uh, Daniel, who is one of the wisest and most intelligent people in all of Scripture, did not consider prophecies to be contracts. He considered them to be an expression of God's intention if people were willing to partner with him in prayer. The second thing that's interesting to me about that is he knew he would never see this, and yet he immediately goes to prayer about this. Daniel understood prayer can be used for people you will never see, and so he begins a prayer assignment immediately and continues it daily. How long would it take for you to give up praying for someone or something? I think long-term praying will challenge our patience. You know, we live in a day when I can get an answer to almost any question that I want the answer to within seconds on a smart device. And so it really challenges us when it takes a lot longer to see an answer to prayer. I also think that long-term praying will challenge our assumptions because when we don't get an immediate response, we might assume that God is unaware or that he doesn't care. Both of those things are not true. When we actually take on a long-term prayer assignment, we begin to think differently about what we're praying for and who we are praying for. Because the truth is, when it comes to spiritual sight, we all are a little bit nearsighted. We tend to just notice the things right in front of us. But long-term praying helps us actually see beyond our present circumstances, our current limitations, and our current deadlines. Um, we tend to overestimate what we can get done in a day. Does anybody else do that besides me? And we underestimate what God could do through our lifetime. I think it's John Maxwell who says that, that um, reincarnation might be true because he can't believe that he got this far behind in one lifetime. And we feel like that sometimes. We overestimate what we can get done in a day, but we vastly underestimate what God might be able to do through our life. Daniel's not just a 9-11 prayer. Uh, Daniel is the kind of guy that goes regularly before the throne of God and intercede for things that he may never see. So here's some prayer tips from Daniel. And the first is this, create a habit. Just create a habit. If you're going to be engaged in long-term prayers, it's going to take a habit. Look at this passage. It says, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where... The windows opened toward Jerusalem three times a day. He got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Three times a day. That, that's more than, than uh, most of us brush our teeth in the course of a day. Uh, for some of us, that's more than we floss in an entire lifetime. It's just, just kind of like that. And yet he creates a habit of prayer. Three times every day he goes to an upstairs room. He opens the windows towards Jerusalem, a city that he cannot see from where he is because he understands that we're not limited by our, our spiritual sight. We're only limited by our physical sight. And so he develops this habit. He's, he's not taking all day. These aren't long seasons of prayer, but it's consistent habit of prayer. The second... Uh, tip that Daniel gives us is that you can add body language to your prayer. Add body language to your prayer. Some of us are uh, talk with our hands. Let's just see how many people in the room you, you tend to express yourself and your hands get moving when you, when you go. Yeah, it's just kind of a natural thing that happens. And what is true is even if you don't think you're a hand talker, I can tell you that your body language says a lot about whether you're engaged or disengaged or you're anxious or you're hopeful. And this is what it says in that passage we just looked at. It says he got down on his knees. Daniel got down on his knees. You know, Americans don't get down on our knees. We don't do that. Uh, we nod, we wave, we don't kneel. Kneeling indicates that someone else has more authority and we are subordinate to them or submitted to them. And Americans aren't really good at that, but Daniel said that there was value in that physical posture, not every time, not all the time, but occasionally reminding ourselves that God is the one who is in control and we are submitted to him. There's other ways that we can use body language. Everybody just try this uh, real quick. Just take your hand right in front of you, hands, hands down, palms down. Just set it right there. Okay, you can put it down. Sometimes, in fact, the Quakers used to do this, uh, ancient prayer tradition, is they would start their prayers with their palms down with things that they needed to release. 
things that they needed to let go of. Maybe it was their sins that they wanted to let go of, or maybe it was their fears that they needed to let go of. This time of year, there's a lot of static electricity, and sometimes it's hard to let go of something because it seems to stick to you. But our fears can be like that too. And there's a lot of wisdom in coming to God and turning hands down and just saying, I need to let go of some fears because they keep attracting back to me. I don't want them to control me. Or maybe just letting go of our desire to control other people or certain situations. Now, let's try this. Just take your hand and stick it up, palms up. All right? You put your hands back down. That was a prayer that the Quakers used to pray too, where they would put their hands up just to say that they were receiving something from God. Maybe they were receiving his peace. That really, they, couldn't, they couldn't come up with a rational explanation for why this calm was invading their heart but they wanted to receive it. Or maybe they were receiving a joy that really was, they were unable to uh, describe how wonderful it was, but they still wanted to receive it. Or hope, because in our world, there's so much hopelessness or grace or gifts. There's so many things our outrageously generous God wants to release into our lives. And sometimes coming to God in prayer and just going palms up, just telling God, I'm, I'm here to receive whatever good thing you have for me. It's a very powerful thing to do. Uh, let's try this. This will stretch a little more. Let's just try one hand up. All right? One hand up. Very good. You can put them back down. I won't leave you up there all morning. Uh, but what, that represents a couple of things. For example, if you've ever been in court having to give testimony as a witness, uh, they will have you put one hand on the Bible and raise your right hand, and then they'll say, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? And, and then you have to say that you will. And what are they doing? They're, they're putting their hand up, and they're doing that when they make a promise. Or if, if you were watching the Super Bowl and you were an Eagles fan, there were several times in the course of that game when they scored, and it's almost inevitable your hands go up. Almost never happens in a Bills game, but it does happen for other teams who hands go up, or sometimes it's not just hands up like at the end of the game when the gun goes off and the game is over and your team has won. It's not just a hand up, it's a fist up. That, that, that's, that's victory. We triumphed, we won. And sometimes in our prayers, we need to make promises to God. And sometimes in our prayers, we need to acknowledge when victory has been granted. There's times that we can add prayer or to our prayer language, some body language, and then also add focus. Focus. For some of us, this is a little bit harder. And uh, this is how he showed it. It's a really great passage. He said, like giving thanks to his God. He got down three times a day on his knees, and in addition to the things he would ask for, he would focus on some things to be grateful for. There are lots of things he could have been frustrated about in his life, but he chose to give thanks. Giving thanks helps you focus on something different. It actually helps you see different things. You see, we don't focus on what we see. We see what we focus on. There's a study, when I tell you about it, you're not going to believe it's true, but it's actually true. They took people... And they told them, we're going to show you a video of a team of players on a basketball court passing the basketball back and forth to each other. And what we want you to do is to count the number of passes. They would show them the video. When the video was over, they would ask them how many passes. And almost everyone said 15 because that's how many passes there were. And then they would ask them, did you see the gorilla? And one out of two people said, what gorilla? There wasn't any gorilla. And they said, oh, yes, there was a gorilla who came out on the court in between the players, stood, looked directly at the camera, beat his chest, and then walked off the court. And they said, that's not possible. I didn't see that. And then they'd replay the video, and there it was. How could they miss a gorilla beating his chest in between the players on the court? And it's because of what they were focused on. You do not focus on what you see. You see what you focus on. And for some of us, we need to start focusing on some things to be grateful for. For example, in our house, ice cream is a vitamin. And we try to get our vitamin every single day. And I can't tell you how many times I just enjoy a good bowl or dish or cone of ice cream. It's absolutely wonderful. Why not thank God for that? I've told him it's one of his best inventions. I really have. 
I think the difference in heaven, somebody says, will there be ice cream in heaven? Yes, and it will be healthy for you there. That's the difference. It'll be there. So maybe something went right. Maybe you got the parking spot you wanted. Maybe someone was gracious or kind to you. Maybe you wanted to put a few more dollars at the end of the month than you were expecting. There's all kinds of things that you can be grateful for, but you have to focus in order to be able to see them. And it's absolutely amazing that once you start focusing, all the incredible ways you will see that God is at work in your life. See, the simple truth is we're easily distracted. Long-term praying can help us focus. And then consider a prayer menu. The fourth tip that Daniel gives us is to consider a prayer menu. A prayer menu. Look at what he says in Daniel 10. He said, at that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks, and I ate no choice food, no meat, no wine, no ice cream touched my lips, for, and I used no lotions at all until three weeks were over. Uh, there are things that happen in our lives that feel like mourning. It seems to knock the energy out of us. It seems to become wearying to us. We seem to be sadder because of it. And Daniel had a strategy for that, and he would alter his diet with a really intentional, spiritual, strategic move. By the way, uh, uh, Jesus also indicated that this was a good thing to do. He, he suggested that there were times when there were assaults or invasions of the evil one into our lives that could only be undone or repelled if we were willing to engage in prayer, and, and this is what the ancient practice is called, and fasting. That, that we would allow something that feels like mourning to impact the kinds of things that we were eating. See, fasting is just altering your daily food. And, and Daniel's uh, uh, responsibilities were so vast and his portfolio was so wide that he couldn't eliminate all food for a period of time. He needed his strength, and so he eliminated things like meat and, and sweets. And I know some of you are going, what else is there? Just you take away the meat and the sweets, there's nothing left. But, but that's what he did. This is not a hunger strike. Daniel is not saying, I'm not going to eat until you give me what you want, what I want. That's not a good strategy for God. You can go about 40 days. He can last longer than you can. Right? He'll, he'll tell you, I'll see you in about 40 days. Uh, it doesn't have to be a complete fast of food could be just removing some favorite foods for a season. But here's the reason why you do it. Because there's something that you can't understand. It's not making sense, and you need insight. So sometimes this practice allows a spiritual infusion of insight into our lives. Second, to humble yourself. By the way, if you do anything affecting your diet, it's a very humbling thing. You know, just try going without a meal and you discover how incredibly controlled we are by regular intake of calories. Or just eliminate some things off the menu that you prefer. And it's astonishing how much our attitude can be affected by that. They have a word for this. It's called hangry. Hangry. When you're hungry, you're angry. And it's very humbling. Or, like I said, to break spiritual opposition. The point is is that these tips are ways that we can invest in something that may well last beyond our lifetime. And here's what I want you to see. Most of us think prayer takes time, but in truth, it saves time. When we moved into our new home, Sue wanted the mudroom behind our garage to be painted red. Now, she'd been trying to paint something red for our entire marriage, but since this was a room nobody would see, I thought it would be safe to do that. And I don't mind painting, but my schedule was such that it was going to be a while before I could get to it. So we hired a young, enterprising young man who had some paint skills and wanted to learn a little extra money. And so he painted the room red, and it looked terrible. You could see streaks, and it, just, it didn't cover correctly. And so he painted it again, and it still looked bad. And he painted it again and again, and again, five coats of red before that thing looked decent. Well, he wasn't an expert, and we didn't know that when you're using paint of certain colors, you really need a primer. And there's a primer that you use when you're going to paint red, and it looks gray, but it makes a big difference. And anyone who paints knows you often need a prime 
on the surface before you start to paint. And it seems like it's taking too much time, but it improves the quality of the effort and it means that there's less time taken because you don't have to keep doing it over and over again. Prayer is the primer for your day. It may seem unnecessary, and we may feel like we do not have the time, but it actually makes our life better, and it often keeps us from having to do things over and over and over again. Long-term praying helps us see more. It helps us adjust our priorities. It helps to purify our motives. You can influence things beyond your reach and beyond your years. You could be praying for your children and their future spouse, for your grandchildren and the way they will make a difference in the world. You can be praying for a spiritual climate in our culture that you might not see a huge shift in in your entire lifetime, but God could use your prayers to begin something that will make a huge difference over time. I believe that God wants to do these kinds of things in our lives and through our lives. You know, it's that time of year, it's Olympics, and I love the Summer Olympics, and I love the Winter Olympics, and I love watching just these incredible individuals who've devoted so much of their life to a particular athletic skill. And I love to see them stand on the podium, and when they play the national anthem of their country, or if you're from Russia, the national anthem of the Olympics, uh, behind. And, and this is what I've never seen. I've never seen this. I've never seen this. I've never seen a person on the podium go, yeah, this wasn't worth it. All that time, all that practice, all that training, all that exercise, all that sacrifice, none of it. It wasn't worth it for this, for this little medal. I would never do this again. Nobody ever says that. And what I will tell you is if you will invest in long-term prayers when the prayer is answered, you won't be the person that says, I wish I hadn't invested that kind of time and that kind of sacrifice into that because this is what's true. Long-term prayers may feel boring, boring, but answers to them are absolutely stunning. And it's what changes our world. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, um, sometimes when it comes to the long-term issues in life, we have a short attention span. There's so many urgent things that capture our attention and soak up our energy. Would you help prompt us today with some things that we might l not live to see the answers to in our lifetime, but we can make a difference in our world? Would you help us develop that habit in our life to use the prayer tips of a man who changed the world because he knew how to open a window and bend a knee and have the most important conversation any person can ever have. Help us with that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.